Shazam Fury of the Gods review and thoughts. So, I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I loved. This video will have some jokes and I will get into a little serious stuff. Now, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. So, I start this video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so. Hold up an index finger. Until I'm done with the spoilers, you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. And, yeah, once I get into the thoughts, please note, I will be spoiling everything in the movie. In in those, yeah, in the thoughts parts, sections. Including discussing the very ending, so do not watch that before you've watched the movie. Unless you're certain you will not be watching the movie. So, the, let's see, let's get ready, there, so... The movie is rated PG-13, and that is... Uh, my language in this video will also be PG-13. And... Let's see... Yeah, the, the rating makes a lot of sense for this movie. You know, this one does not get as harsh with the horror. There, there is still some horror in this, but it's not at, like... The first movie really was pushing the PG-13. It's pretty ridiculous that it got away with the PG-13. I feel like they should have cut back at least a tiny bit. But the but but yeah, this one it's definitely PG-13. And let's see, that brings us to the. So, so yeah, um, obviously it's fairly relevant how I feel about, you know, mythology. Big fan, I, I you know, for, for this review, I, I love mythology, uh, and, and Greek mythology is one of my favorites. So, yeah, and, and that's definitely, like, obviously if you're like a purist, if you're like, oh, it has to be exactly it was, it was written, you're going to be frustrated by certain things in this. But if you just want to see stuff from Greek mythology on screen, this is going to really scratch that itch for you. So, yeah, some some fantasy stuff that I really love. Uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the Hobbit trilogy, the first never-ending story movie, Legend. Now, let's see. So, the... Yeah. So, a ranking of all DCEU movies other than this one to give you an idea of whether you're particularly going to agree with my thoughts on the DCEU. Worst to Best, Batman v Superman, Wonder Woman 1984, Snyder Cut, 2016 Suicide Squad, 2017 Justice League, Man of Steel, Black Adam, and then we get to the ones that I love. Wonder Woman 1, Aquaman, Shazam 1, Birds of Prey, and 2021 Suicide Squad. And that... So, yeah, you know, there, one of the things that are... A couple of things that are really cool about comic books and adaptations of them. You know, you can have many wild concepts, have them play off each other. This one definitely has that with the with the Greek mythology stuff and the the general you know not not absolutely everything is about Greek mythology but like there's a lot of stuff about like deep lore and you know the kind of stuff that you wouldn't see if you weren't if it had nothing to do with like comic books you know and another is that it can do a really great job commenting on you know real issues and th this one also does that you know it's it's still very much about family but yeah there is a little bit more to it the, the some of the some of the family interpersonal conflict here is different from what it was in the first movie 
and yeah, it's not quite as strong, but there there is still some good stuff there. I've watched this movie once. I started recording basically as soon as I got back from the theater, so it is very fresh in my mind. So, yeah, the plot, Wikipedia does a pretty good job here. Teenager Billy Batson and his foster siblings, who transform into adult superheroes by saying Shazam, fight the daughters of Atlas. And... Let's see. So the um, yeah, for those who don't know, I watch and review pretty much every single comic book adaptation movie that goes to theaters, and you know stuff that's in continuity with you know. But this was one that I was actually like looking forward to. I I really really like yeah I I love the original Shazam movie. It's not perfect. But it has personality. It stands out. You know, the... the Yeah. You know, it's... It's... A superhero story by way of big. It's just, like, right, right off the bat. Like, immediately, it stands out in a very crowded field. We have a lot of comic book movies these days. Yeah. I, I was really, really psyched for this, and, yeah, the, the, um, let's see, and it, it was as good as I hoped, based on, like, trailers and such, now, uh, let's see, I did not watch this in 3D, there was not a 3D showing near me, um, let's see, I think it was, Okay, I'm I'm not 100%. Yeah, it was probably released in 3D. That's not a huge amount of them that don't get 3D today. Anyway, let's dive into the writing. So this was written by Chris Morgan and Henry Gaiden. Now, let's see. So Gaiden wrote the... Uh, let's see, wrote the, the first one, and something called Earth to Echo, there's someone inside your house, gotta say, I never even heard of, of those, and Chris Morgan, other than writing this, he wrote some of the Fast and Furious movies, and the spinoff, and, and he wrote Wanted, and cellular and yeah he he as far as I can tell he did not help write the first movie so it's possible that he is largely responsible for the stuff that's different this is definitely you can tell that like with the first movie like they gave him they gave d d the director David F Sandberg enough money to make it look good and to like yeah you know to to make to, to last the entire running time but not so that he could just go bonkers with massive set pieces and such and when the movie became a hit they did give him enough money for that for this so this one has a number of scenes that you expect from these kinds of movies, but we didn't really get in the the first one because it was, you know, if the first movie hadn't done well, it's it's a it's a big ask. It's a it's a pretty ridiculous concept, even for comic books. You know, teenager says the word Shazam and gets superpowers, and his body becomes that of an adult. You know, it's that's a lot to to ask the audience to get on board with, but. Once they saw how many of us were in bo on board, they were like, you know what, that's okay, more money. And, yeah, so, this is not a hugely, like, plot twist heavy movie. So, I wouldn't go into it, like, just hoping to really get into the, the plot twists, but the ones there are, are good. 
There are not too many, there are not too few, and the movie doesn't fall apart once you learn certain twists. Now, direction. So this was directed by David F. Sandberg, who used to direct horror, which was very visible in the first one, and you can still tell here. And yeah, like, um, other than, yeah, yeah, Annabelle Creation, that was him. Uh, lights out, and I flip you off for four hours are the movies he's made. But yeah, you can, you can really tell that he loves the, you know, he loves the source material. He really, and, and the, the concept, like there's an infectious joy to both of these movies where it's just like, you know, because it is, it, like, once you get the audience on board, it's an amazing, con you, there's so much, you know, there's so much you can do with it. Ultimately, this movie does not do as much, like, commentary on, you know, a child in an adult's body kind of thing the way that the first movie did. But, you know, yeah, for, for sure this one is more about, like, the spectacle. It, it loses its identity and uniqueness somewhat. So, I have some critic quotes. So, let's see the... Yeah, so, more confident, bigger budget, better pacing, more action. The dragon and Rachel Zegler powers are amazing. And let's see, at the end of the day, the motivation of the villains is too similar. You know, jealousy, that they feel that Billy should not have his powers, he doesn't deserve them. Great to see more of the Shazam family. We see their lair now that they have powers from the start of the movie. That was one of my favorite things, and I'm really, really glad, because that is, like, one of the best things about the first movie. And there's a lot, it's a long list. There's a lot of really amazing things. One of the best is the 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 family, the the the, the interaction between them. And, yeah, we get more of that here, and yes, uh, I can't believe I'm blanking on her name, but I'll have it momentarily. Darla is still just, she's, she's too pure for this world. It's, it's just, you're allowed to hate these two movies. You're, you're allowed to think that they are just the worst pieces of garbage ever, like, nothing worse in the universe exists, or even could potentially hypothetically exist in the hypothetical multiverse. But if Darla does not melt your heart, your heart is made of stone. I said that last time, and I'm doubling down. It is, she is just such a, and, and there are some great moments where we have this, like, discussion between the, you know, the Shazamily and like, someone will say something that's like, okay, I mean, that's kind of harsh, but I guess it's true. And it'll just cut to superhero Darla making good, and she'll be like, yeah, that's true. It's just, it's just, yeah, the, the you know, and, and yeah, the cast still do a great job embodying, you know, that, you know, we have a bunch of adults here that are, that have to convince the audience, no, 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 that's that's actually a teenager in an adult's body. And they do such great job. Uh, so, yeah, such great jobs, all of them. Um, Adam Brody... Can he just... Can can we put him in everything? I, I know, I've been saying that a lot recently. It's, it's getting to be a long list. Okay, so for those, you know, keep, keeping track, okay, so... Jessica Jones, Bo Katan, and now also Adam Brody. I kind of yeah, just just he's he's so good. He's so much fun, and he's having so much fun. Like this is you can tell he's been dreaming of of this kind of thing for many years, and he is relishing it. And just yeah, um, but yeah, the the like arguments between them about what they should focus on and how to proceed, and just, yeah, so, so much. 
Now, let's see. Right, and yeah, so, you know, one of the, the big things is Billy is about to age out of the foster care system. He's worried he's going to lose his found family. And he's also suffering from imposter syndrome. He feels like he's not a good enough leader. And, you know, ultimately, that is not as... They don't get quite as much out of that as the, the kind of thing that, you know, in the first... Like Billy's search for his real, for his biological mother, that really gets to you, you know. And here, like, it's it's not bad. It's it's, you know, it's good stuff, but it's just not quite as impactful. Infused with the childlike joy that made the first so enjoyable, Shazam: Fear of the Gods explores the complexities of what it means to be a hero and how everyone can be worthy if given the chance. It isn't a superpower that makes us powerful. Absolutely love that. And... Yeah, the, uh, it's not as good as the first Shazam movie, which explored what it's like to be a superhero, when in reality you're still just a kid in the sequel. That aspect is still mentioned quite a bit, but not really explored. And... Let's see... Um, yeah, so the, uh, um, there's a, there's a thing fairly early on. I'm not going to get into details about it. I, I think, arguably, it's a spoiler, but there is a, you know, fairly, yeah, something happens early on where, I saw another reviewer say that it doesn't make sense that the, you know, it's it's basically the there's a negative reaction to the the heroes, despite the fact that they you know they did do some amazing things, and yeah, this this one critic said, does that make any sense to you? And I'm like, it's super realistic that, like, I don't know if I want to get too much into, how political do I want to get this early into the video? I will just say that there are plenty of groups of people in the real world who do incredibly important, beneficial work. And then you have, you know, people in the media saying that they shouldn't be doing it, that it doesn't matter. So, yeah. Let's see. More compelling threat than the first one. I like that these are consequences for breaking the staff in the first movie. Much bigger film with bigger and bigger, better action set pieces. More memorable at the cost of the charm unique to the first movie. First jump back and forth between childish humor and dark horror. This one is more, uh, yeah, more tonally consistent. And yeah, um, this is, yeah, this is going to be a direct quote. I haven't myself seen the, there's an ad that apparently, but yeah. They actually spoil a major cameo in an ad, so stay off the internet if you want to avoid that. In all seven of my years of YouTube being, uh, YouTubing about movies, I've never seen such a major spoiler in a piece of marketing. The post credit scenes are important. And let's see. Yeah, and he points out too little Adam Brody, which I definitely, yeah, 100%. You know, here's hoping that they will make him a bigger part in in future installments. But he does get at least a, li a little bit more here than he did in the first one, where it's really only near the end of... I just realized I didn't specify, but yeah, I am spoiling... I'm spoiling everything leading up to this movie. I'm not spoiling this movie in the review, but everything else DCU, I am... DCEU. Now, let's see. So, yeah, the, the opening of the movie does a good job setting up some important things. 
for the rest of the movie. Now, I am not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits with what came before. I am happy with how the movie ends, and see, yeah, there's not really Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing. Now, let's see the so yeah, there are two. There's a there's a mid credit scene and a post credit scene. Make sure you stay all the way to the end if you want to. Uh, yeah, and. Like, they're not, like, if you don't care that much about this, I guess you're not necessarily going to care. If, if, you know, if you like, they are both relevant to Shazam, like, you know, I don't really want to give away here whether or not they're about the future, but if you care about the, the you know, this version of Shazam, I would definitely make sure to, to watch both of them. We're, you know, 15 years into this thing, and I still see people leaving before the post credit scenes are done. I, yeah, to each their own. Hopefully they, they look it up online afterwards. The use of superpowers is quite good. You know, they... they yeah, they, they come up with some, some good stuff for the, you know, basically, the end of the first movie made it clear, like, the Shazam Lee are nearly unstoppable, you, you really, you know, all of them can fly, all of them can throw lightning bolts, and all this stuff, so you have to come up with something special in order to make it, like, okay, no, seriously, this, you know, why, why, why do you need all of them? You know, that's one thing. And how can, you know, something that happens with regular people, how can that actually be so important that it needs, you know, the Shazamly, or at least one member of the Shazamly there to do it? You know, in the first one, he's kind of just, being a being a jerk using his powers for his own benefit and such in this he is de devoted to the idea of being a hero so yeah they have to come up with some some you know major threats and they do you know i i guess it's so early yeah suffice to say there is a there's a bridge that needs some, some, you know, there's a, there's an issue with a bridge that needs help, and, yeah, the movie makes it very clear, if, if not for the, the members of the Shazam Lee, there is no way this would go well, this, so, so, yeah, you know, that's, that's the thing that you kind of have to deal with in, you know, a comic book adaptation, why are we not just, like, calling the cops for this situation? So, the character. So I have some critic quotes. Let's see. Jack Dylan Grazer and Adam Brody are both delightful. Try their best to make Freddy's real life and superhero alter ego gel. The rest of the Foster Clan are not given any, you know, other than him and, and Billy are not given any screen time to flesh out their identities beyond a single defining trait, if they're lucky to even get one. Lucy Lou and Hillman are having fun with the scenes that are just them. Everything else seems so beneath them that in recognizing the meth mess around them, they don't really try. I don't know. I, I felt like they were making an effort. Now, Zachary Levi as Jassam and... Yeah, he still, you know, he still does a really, really solid job. You know, it is this thing of, like, he, you know, he is, like, an adult. And, you know, big muscles and everything. But he still, he's, you know, when you look in his eyes and when you see the way he behaves and hear what he says, he still comes across as just a, a big kid. And, yeah, 
really, really nicely done. Shazam is back with the body of a man, the mind of a child, played by Zachary Levi, the actor with the name of an old prospector. And Asher Angel plays Billy Batson, the, yeah, the teenage, you know, normal form of him. And, yeah, still does a, a really good job. The, yeah, it's not his fault, but, but yeah, for sure the, the, the drama is, does not hit as hard, like, you know, in the, in the first movie, like, whenever you saw his face, whenever you saw Asher Angel, it was like, uh, you know, he's, he's really, he's really upset about, you know, not being able to be with his mother, and having been apart from, from her for so long, and then at the end of the movie, he, you know, he would rather, you know, yeah, he, he goes to be with his found family instead. And in this, like, there's some there's some stuff, but ultimately it's not the the um yeah, it just doesn't hit as hard. But Asher Angel is doing what he can. And yeah, Jack Dylan Grazer as Frederick Freddie Freeman. Such a great job. He he really is just the the you know he's still very much a a nerd and they get some some fun out of that where he is he's sharing scenes with another character and he's like he's trying to solve it with his specialized knowledge and things don't go exactly as he had hoped and they yeah they have some fun with that and let's see, yeah, Anna Brody as the adult superhero form of Freddy. And I don't know if I want to give away exactly what, uh, yeah, I'm not going to give away exactly what she plays, but Rachel Zegler is in this and she does a really great job, like, the the you know at at first it might not look like there's a lot to her character it seems very just like stereotypical and kind of thing but something is revealed there is more to her and yeah she has to do some some heavy lifting and she does it very convincingly i don't think i've seen her in anything else but she does a great job here i i hope to see her in more And yeah, Ross Butler as the adult superhero form of Eugene Choi, obsessive gamer, and Yin Chen plays the teenage version version of Eugene. And yeah, Megan Good as the adult superhero form of Billy's good natured younger foster sister Darla Dudley, and Faith Herman plays the teenage version of Darla. And Let's see. Yeah, and, you know, she is still chatty, bad at keeping secrets, and just all-round adorable. Like, just... Yeah, so, so adorable. Now... Let's see. Yeah, and Lucy Liu as Calypso, a daughter of Atlas. German Hansu as Shazam, an ancient wizard who gave Billy his powers. He's one of the best parts of the first. Keeping in mind, I love almost everything about it. So happy to see him return, despite him crumbling to dust. And yes, they do address that. I, you know, when I saw him in trailers, I was like, I mean, I'm glad, but how they do address it? And and like other characters point out, he crumbled to dust. You know, we we saw it with our own eyes. It wasn't just like we we heard mention of oh, he, you know, I guess off screen. No, no, no crumbled to dust right in front of us, it is addressed, and yeah, I'm really, really glad. Jaiman Hansu also put him in everything, please, just absolutely amazing, and I really appreciate, like, in this movie, they gave him more, you know, like, in, in the first one, there's not a lot of dimension to him, he has the, you know, he carries the weight of the world on his shoulders, and, you know, he's, he's great, he's, he's both but, you know, he's funny when needs to be, he's intense when that's called for, 
but there's not a huge amount of depth to him, and I really felt like they did something interesting with him here that, yeah, I'm really, really glad. Yeah, again, like, you know, they were like, okay, we got we got to bring him back. He's so good. He's so freaking good in this, you know. So, yeah. And Helen Mirren as Hespera, another daughter of Atlas. And, yeah, I love the work of Helen Mirren and Lucy Liu. So glad to see that they're, they're still working and, the, the you know, the, getting this kind of action role. It's just so good. And, yeah, you know, Helen Mirren, there is the, the kind of authority, like, you've, you know, Dame Helen Mirren played the queen. You're not gonna, you know, you don't just pick someone off the street to play the queen. You need someone who can seem like she's carrying the entire kingdom on her shoulders and, you know, stiff upper lip and the whole thing. And she, yeah, you know, she has, she has authority and, yeah, she is, she is the one in charge of the, of the sisters and does it just such a, such a good job. It, it is, you know, when you hear her speak, it is like, okay, you know what? Honestly, I wasn't even on your side before, but you make such an impression. Okay, fair enough. I will follow you. Just command me. Lead and I will follow. You know, and Lucy Lou, the the kind of just you know, she I don't mean to to minimize, because she's incredibly talented, but some of the things she does incredibly well that she does here are this kind of otherworldly, kind of exotic, mystique kind of thing. And, and not the character, but the the trait, the feminine mystique, and the the um, the um, yeah, the implied threat. Like you see her, and it's like, oh, careful, that's she's dangerous. You know, something that Quentin Tarantino also used quite well in in Kill Bill when he cast her and, and directed her. Um, I. Th think that is a, but but yeah you know there is this like it feels cuz you know she's supposed to be this you know otherworldly you know uh, uh, greek mythology you know person you know you again you can't just get some rando you have to get someone who can convince you that what you're looking at is not an actor. They're they're not human. They're humanoid, but not human. And yeah, every single daughter of Atlas does a you know act actress playing a daughter of Atlas in this does an amazing job. And let's see the. Yeah, and the the Mary Brumfield is played by Grace Caroline Curry, and you know, it, yeah, she now also portrays the adult superhero form, which I am almost one hundred percent certain that she didn't in the first one. I'm really glad that they did make that choice because. We have scenes where she and Billy are talking about serious topics, and it would just feel weird if it's supposed to be like, no, no, no really, because, like, we, we can accept that Billy, you know, has two different appearances. We can, we can fully accept, because they, they're so similar, the, the, you know, yeah, you, you buy that this is the same person. With Mary, like, the fact that she does superheroics and also has these mature conversations with Billy, it's really, really good that it is the same actress in, in you know, yeah, in, in both cases. And, yeah, I, I'm really, really glad that they did the, the yeah. 
and Jovan Armand plays Pedro Pena. DJ Catrona plays his adult superhero form. The, the yeah. And Marta Milans and Cooper Andrews plays Rosa and Victor Vasquez, the foster parents of Billy and his siblings. And that brings so yeah, the dialogue. There are a lot of jokes, and I will grant that maybe maybe about fifteen percent of them struggle a little. I, I'm not sure I would say that there were any that were just like land with a thud and just like completely break the, you know, and, and everyone's just like, wow, that was, but some of them are not, don't get the laugh that they were intended to. But yeah, the material is mostly good and very frequently born out of character. Like, you know, I mentioned that you know, someone will say something brutally honest, you know, uh, yeah, in the, in the Shazam Lee, and it'll cut to Darla, and she does the, you know, she's not like, see, see, I told you, I you know, but just this kind of, yeah, I, I can't lie, that that is technically true, you know, kind of thing, and just, yeah, so, the, the, um, I did see one, at least one critic say that you could have, swapped around dialogue and it wouldn't really have made a difference there is some truth to that not not all of it but there's definitely some where it didn't really need to be that particular character saying that particular thing now the cinematography was handled by Gaila Pados who has 19 credits as cinematographer uh, let's see, I am, oh, okay, so, yeah, among others, Predators, and, let's see, two Maze Runners, two Juman, both Juman, both of the new Jumanjis, haven't watched those, but I have heard that there is some, some good photography in them. Basic Instinct 2, I guess, you know, some, someone had to. But yeah, the, the cinematography is quite good here. The, the, um, the, um, when, when there are action scenes, sometimes there's a lot going on in the action scene, and I never, like, lost focus. I was never like, wait, what is, where is this, you know, the, the geography and, sort of yeah the, the geography makes sense and the the different things like the 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 pacing of the action scenes was was aided by the cinematography that brings us to the editing which is handled by Michael Oller who has 14 credits as editor and yeah he edited or, oh, Michelle Aller, uh, who edited the first one as well, Annabelle Creation, Lights Out, so, yeah, the, the, you know, good working relationship with director David F. Sandberg, so that's, that's four different things that he's directed that Michelle has edited, and Michelle also edited the 2022 Scream movie, which is exceptionally edited so yeah big fan of of michelle's work and yeah um the um the editing is also quite strong the the you know a number of the jokes rely on the editing there are smash cuts and and such where like basically you know some of the time a scene will play out but sometimes there there will be like this big rousing you know we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do this and then it's smash cuts and they're like okay so we did not do that and you know yeah you gotta you gotta get it exactly right for that kind of thing to work because you just did something that like 
hypothetically could completely throw it out of whack for for the audience. They might be like, "I was enjoying that scene. Why'd you why'd you end it like that?" You know. But yeah, it it works really really well, and the the action is also kept quite clear by the editing. Now the let's see if we can find budget. I guess okay. So no budget information on IMDb. Let's check Wikipedia. So the yeah, the budget was between 100 and 125 million, and it does show. You know, it feels expensive, and it is the. I can imagine this will make a, a good profit. It's it's too early to say, but the the um, yeah. Um. Let's see. So yeah, this was filmed. Uh. Let's see. Okay, it's a set in film. Philadelphia. I'm not entirely sure. Okay, and at least parts were filmed in Atlanta, Georgia. But yeah, the you know this this is one of those big blockbuster movies that have to have a lot of different settings. You know, the the um, there is just a a not just expectation, but a genuine requirement. You have to have, the, you know, this many distinct settings, and you know sometimes it it can feel like, okay, this this is just mandated. There's no reason for there to be so many. You know, I I just rewatched Rogue One, which I still I still think there's a lot to love about that movie. Boy, do some of the scenes, especially some of the early scenes, just feel like, okay, you really just needed to have a scene set in this place. It's cause because it's like you didn't you didn't need that scene. Like, if you cut that scene, nothing in the story would be like harder to follow or something. It's just you know, and I realized that movie was also you know, it had problems because of like reshoots and and stuff. So, you know, I'm not saying it's it's complete, but that movie it really felt like okay, you do not need this many different settings. This movie, like, I guess if I didn't know, I might still have get like if you if you ask someone, they might be able to guess. Okay, that the reason there are that many different settings in this movie is because they there's an you know they have to be there. There have to be, but they always make them count. You know the the I mentioned the the bridge thing. Like it's a very very memorable sequence. You know I I get that. Like you know it's it's definitely the kind of thing where if we're just looking at it as like well we have so and so much money you know we might have to cut at least one of these scenes the the bridge thing might you know yeah it it does it does like thematic stuff but it's not necessarily yeah it, you know it's not necessarily necess it, it's it required for the plot you know but but yeah that's the thing like every Every scene in this movie does have some purpose. It's not always plot. Sometimes it's character or theme or such. But I honestly, if you think that there is a scene in this movie that in no way, like, that, that doesn't set something up, pay something off, have something with plot, characters, or theme, if you legitimately believe you can think of at least one scene that has that, please put it in the comments, and I'll see if I can, you know, I'll, I'll you know, I will honest, if, if I just, if I'm stumped, I will, you know, fess up to that, but right now I feel like, no, all of them, there's, there's always something there. 
now and yeah and the settings look different from each other and yeah like honestly you know the the I'm not super familiar with Philadelphia but I feel like the the they they do a good job of taking different parts of the the city and you know yeah the the um yeah you know and and using them in you know as as settings to to make it to make it distinct and memorable now the villains are memorable and the the relationship between the the villain and protagonist is not quite you know in the first one it is legitimately this thing of like you know doctor uh Z Z Sivana, i think Do yeah doctor Sivana, you know ever since he was a child he has been you know like he felt so rejected because of this and then in walks billy and he just gets the powers you know there's a there's a powerful conflict there and here it's just not quite the same like the daughters of atlas were never in the same situation as billy was which sivana you know to so yeah there there were you know they were both asked by the wizard you know they they were both tested by the wizard and yeah Sivana looks at Billy and is like you're the champion really you i'm not as good as you that's ridiculous so you know there's a there's a good energy there here like basically like the daughters of atlas feel like the you know they have been robbed betrayed you know and Billy is the, the, you know, yeah, they, they, they target him because of the, the powers. Now, but, but yeah, the, 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 the villains, it's really cool that it is this thing of like, they actually, you know, I, I'm not sure, I don't remember reading about the daughters of Atlas, but yeah, Atlas you know yeah part of part of greek mythology and they actually that it's super cool that that you know that that is a one of the things like the first one feels like you know they're almost scared to to step all the way into the the dceu they they probably kind of figured this is not going to be a big thing you know so they were you know they're not bringing in Superman as a you know major part of of the movie or anything. Well, yeah, at this point I'm, it's, it's yeah. You know, in in the first Shazam basically they reference the DCEU, but they never feature uh, you know anyone established. And then here it's clear like they're you know, it was a success, so let's let's go for it and yeah, it is this thing of if if the you know, if if the the Jazamli have the powers, the you know these what is it six seven powers from the 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 um yeah six six powers from six gods. Well, let's bring in some you know some other characters from the Greek myth. The way that these Greek gods, uh, you know, that's where the powers come from. Yeah, that's that's really really cool. It's it's a major escalation to to have you know but basically like the yeah the breaking of the of the staff at the end of the first movie that was like you know that that has like a ripple effect that you know it's yeah 
that's really, really cool. And, yeah, you know, there's, here's hoping that the, the character will reappear down, you know, in, in stuff in the DCU now that the DCEU is just, yeah. And, and, yeah, I, I could definitely see it, and, yeah, you know, the, the, like, each of these, you know, he, the, the, um, Billy himself, maybe also the Shazam Lee, could be the, the kind of, the God-powered, and, and, like, you know, they have this very specific expertise at dealing with the, the Greek mythological kind of, you know, so, yeah, that, that could be, they could be part of, like, the Justice League or something. Now, that brings us to the score. Now, the, it was composed by Christoph Beck. And, let's see, other than this, I'm not sure there's a lot that I know, but, um, yeah. He composed for the first two Ant-Man movies. Let's see. Edge of Tomorrow and other, like, action and, and comic book stuff. And, yeah, he does a really good job. Like, you know, the, the music really builds of a strong, like, you really get into it. You know, the music works for when it's funny, when it's, like, tense, when it's just really cool action, and just, yeah. And, you know, the original has great needle drops, like Queen's Don't Stop Me Now during the power testing montage. This one also has some great ones. I'm not sure I thought that any of them were quite as good as that, but one that this has is the, um... Ah, uh, what's it called? Uh, is it just called Holding Out for a Hero? Uh, yeah, the the Bonnie Tyler song, and yeah, it's just, that that was really really cool, and it is of course like you know, if you're gonna do this kind of thing, yeah, let's have an actual song where they're singing about like, you know. Yeah, the, the, some of the lyrics go, I need a hero, and then in comes a literal superhero. You know, that's, sometimes you gotta do the obvious gags, you know, and just, yeah, I I quite enjoyed that, although not everybody did. I did read one critic review that did not really think that worked. The sound design is, again, great. The, the movie has some stuff that are, you know, it's not there in real life, and it does not exist in real life, so you really need the audio aspect to sell. You know, yeah, there's a, there's a special effect there, and most of those are quite good. You really got to have some, some good sound design to help sell it, and this one really does. The pacing is pretty good. I never really felt like the movie was just standing still or rushing or... Yeah. And the movie is about... It's just under two hours before the end credits start. But, you know, I already mentioned you should sit through the end credits. With that, it is two hours and 11 minutes. And uh, did I not? Okay, yeah, there it is. Now the best element. It's probably a tie between the <clears throat> the action, the blend of humor and seriousness, and the. the kind of messages you could take away from it. Let's see, worst aspect. I, um... 
yeah, probably the the fact that it is, you know, ultimately the 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 first one does have more of a personality, and this one feels more like, you know, it's it's another one, you know, if you know, I think it was Sean Chandler uh, talks about who pointed out. If you are feeling superhero fatigue, this movie is not going to help. You know, if you're super into Shazam, you're probably going to really enjoy this. But if you don't care that much about Shazam specifically, this is going to be, uh, yeah. Now, so yeah, the, the, uh, but, but yeah. I don't think that it is a big deal. Now, the worst thing... I, I saw some... Yeah. The worst thing I've seen others say was... You know, some, some people said it was too safe. And I definitely... I, I do see what they mean. It is very much... It's not trying to, to get outside of, of what, we're, what we're used to. I don't personally think it's a big deal, but I do get, like, you know, people who are, like, 15 years in, we gotta, we gotta be taking chances with these movies. We can't just keep doing the same thing over and over. The thing I was most worried about was diminishing returns, and, yeah, I didn't really feel like that was a thing here. And the thing I was most looking forward to was something very similar to the first film, and yeah, for that, in some ways it does, but in some ways they did kind of sacrifice that in order to make more crowd-pleasing movie. The trailers do give a little too much away, but also give you a good idea of what the movie is like. So the trailers are... Yeah, one of them is set to Eminem's business, which I very much approve of. Another is set to Drake's started from the bottom. I mean, you could do worse. At least it's rap. And let's see the... Yeah. Ultimately, the, the cover and poster do give a little bit too much away but also give you a really good idea of what the movie is like. And that brings us to Rotten Tomatoes. This has a 53%. So it is rotten. Uh, let's... Oh, that was the wrong thing to click. There we go. 156 reviews, 83 of them fresh. And the average rating is 5.80 out of 10. But the audience score is 85%. Based on more than 250 verified ratings, the average rating is 4.2 out of 5. And the critics' consensus, more unfocused and less satisfying than its predecessor, Jassam Fear of the God still retains almost enough of the source material's silly charm to save the day. I don't think that this this is one of those things where it's 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 too bad that the that that Rotten Tomatoes is binary. This movie is rotten, and so is the um, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name. Um, the first Suicide Squad. That might make you think that there's much... Like, the first Suicide Squad is a complete mess for, for many reasons. Uh, you know, I'm... If, if you just want a, a quick rundown, uh, Folding Ideas did two great videos on it. Or three, I guess. This movie is nowhere near as much of a mess. This movie is just... Fine. To, you know... Going by, like, if, if you read the, the actual reviews, a lot of them are just like, eh, you know, I, it's okay, I guess. It's not like, 
this is the worst thing ever. I, I think I did see one that was just like, my eyes, my eyes. So that's obviously pretty negative. But it, yeah, a bland generic sequel, you know, that's, that's what some of them felt. Action-packed but weightless. Not likely to inspire... Let's see... Bloated... It's bigger and fairly stale, but not better, and it's just, yeah, these are not, like, a lot of the, the critical reviews are not saying it's the worst thing ever made, they're just saying, can we please, we, we gotta be able to do better than this, you know, 15 years, let's, let's do better, let's not just accept something that's not amazing, you know, and I, you know, hopefully it won't put off a lot of people that would end up enjoying it, but, you know, the... And on Metacritic, it has a 46 out of 100, and that makes a lot of sense. That's, yeah. And, yeah, the 46 is based on 45 critic reviews, 9 positive, 30 mixed, 6 negative. That's what we're looking at. You know, the vast majority of critics are like, eh. You know, it's a, it's a thing. It's content. I guess we can, you know, they're not saying, you know, my eyes melted. I can't, you know, I, th this movie was, was worse than a root canal. That's not the, the thing, you know, so... And let's see the yeah, and and some of the some of the negative ones are not even that okay. Most of the negative ones are very negative, but let's see. Yeah, one of them just says this is just the first movie's inferior sequel. The film fails to build on the whimsical foundation of the first film in any way. Again, that's not like burn the theater down kind of review. You know, that's not... So, so yeah. Really glad we also have Metacritic because this really helps you keep perspective. And the user score is 5.6 out of 10 based on 33 ratings, 14 positive, 10 mixed, 9 negative. And let's see. Yeah, several of the negative ones are saying, you know, generic and it's not that. Oh, wow. One person says, not sure what's worse, this or Morbius. It's. I'm glad that you asked. Morbius is worse. Morbius is so much worse than this. Now, there are currently 75 user reviews on IMDb, 58 without spoilers, and it's been hours since I read, I, I think I read about 30 of them. And the ratings... Yeah, so this has a 6.8 out of 10 based on 4,748 IMDb users. And that also makes a lot of sense. So 22.2% gave it 10, 22% gave it 7, 16.2% gave it 8, 13.2% gave it 6, 7.1% gave it 9, 6.7% gave it 1. That is still a lot. I... Yeah, um, I gotta say, anything lower than a 5 seems harsh to me, but okay. 6.5 gave, I, I will let you know exactly what my personal rating is at the end of the review, so so very shortly. But yeah, the 6.5% the, um, gave it 5, 2.9 gave it 4, 1.7 gave it 2, 1.5 gave it 3. So, 
some people did not think very highly of it. The special effects, I, I have seen some people say that they were not that impressive. I will grant there are a couple of things in this that don't look that great. And there were, there were a couple of times where it was like, okay, I'm sorry, but I can tell exactly when there was like the actual actor on set and then the effect took over and that's never a good, you know, you want that to be a completely smooth transition. That wasn't always the case, but some of the biggest stuff looks amazing in this. The the bridge sequence and some of the, you know, Greek mythology stuff just amazing. Just the 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 designs and the like a lot of it is photorealistic. It was it was amazing to to behold. Now there there's some really great stunt work here. Uh, you know these are you know the the some of these you know super powered beings they will like throw each other into walls and stuff like that. And of course some of that is just special effects. But clearly some of the time you actually have a person doing a stunt and it, yeah, works really well. So, let's see. That brings us to the rating. So, yeah, I think ultimately... Yeah, this is I, I rate this eight god given abilities used to kick ass out of ten. And yeah, honestly, you know, I could watch this again tomorrow, you know. I I probably won't. It's extremely rare for me to watch the same thing in theaters more than once, but you know, yeah. And that brings us to the ranking I have and let's see ultimately yeah there we go so my personal ranking all DCEU movies worst to best Batman v Superman Wonder Woman 1984 Snyder Cut, 2016 Suicide Squad, 2017 Justice League, Man of Steel, Black Adam, Jazam 2, Wonder Woman 1, Aquaman, Jazam 1, Birds of Prey 20 Birds of Prey, 2021 Suicide Squad. And that was it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know why I got I I put the emphasis wrong there, but yeah. So so yeah, I I very happy with this one. I, I look forward to what they do next with these characters. And yeah, I, I know some people are, are really despairing over this whole James Gunn DCU thing. I'm I'm very optimistic, I gotta say. I, I remain very optimistic. The the man has not made very many mistakes when it comes to so yeah. That brings us to the thoughts section. So from here on out, spoilers for this movie. Starting with notes taken while watching. So back to the, the pad of paper. There's a lot to love about the opening scene. I don't love that... It seems like we're supposed to laugh at the museum guy for not being, like, hyper-masculine. Like, he's not man enough to deal with these two women. Not not really a fan of that. I really didn't think that was at all necessary. Like, at first it just seemed like, oh, he's, you know, fun, quirky guy. You know, you'd want to go to a museum with someone that passionate about it. But then they have the thing of, you know, he tries to assert himself and the, the daughters just ignore him. But I did really, like you know, so 
Stop me if you've heard this one before. Two daughters of Atlas walk into an exhibit. But yeah, I, I love, there's so much great stuff going on in the opening scene. We get a sense of the relationship between, I already forgot their names, but the Hes Hespera and, I, okay, now I'm too stubborn to, okay, so one of them is Lucy Lou Calypso, yes. Hespera and Calypso, we get a sense of their relationship with each other because we do see, you know, I forget the exact detail, but there was something that Calypso was like, eh, and Hesper's like, no, we have to do this. You have to listen to me. So we immediately get a sense of that's a, a weak spot there. You know, there's something there. And, you know, near the end of the movie, yeah, he you know, Calypso betrays Hespera. And Hespera, you know, betrays her back, I guess. You know, and that's why, you know, if the two of them had worked together as a perfect unit, you know, how would Shazam have been able to stop it? You know, he's only able to stop it because he and Hespera agree on the bomb thing and she shrinks the, the force field. So, you know... And, and, yeah, so that's one thing. We also get a sense of how driven they are, how brutal, you know, they kill this entire room of people just because, you know, whatever. And the, you know, we, we see how powerful they are. With a whisper, they, they can, you know, yeah, they can turn people into to stone statues. Or just by just by whispering, just by spreading a message, they can you know get have people like attacking each other, you know, completely without reason, which I'm pretty sure is a metaphor for Twitter. And I, I really appreciate the detail that not only do they turn all these people into stone statues, they knock over one of them, and we see, oh yeah, the you know. The stone falls apart. No, he's... We're, we're not talking about, oh, you know, encased in stone and, you know, as long as someone, like, frees them later, they'll be fine. No, no, no. They are now stone, and when they get knocked over, the stone breaks apart, they are gone. That is it, you know. And, you know, we have the thing of the, you know... Um, what's it called? One of the one of the daughters says something like, you know, whoever is the the champion, the wizard's champion in this world, must be a genius. You know, smash cut to to Billy in teenage form saying that he's terrible. And Skittles, um, Skittles. I I think Skittles are fine. I've had them. I don't, I'm not, I don't have some kind of problem with Skittles as a product. But I do think that it was pretty awkward how they were just shooting. Like, before I watched the movie, I saw reviews that said, oh, it's basically just an ad for Skittles. And I was like, that's, no, come on. Look. The DCEU can get really, really obnoxious with their product placement. I know. But saying that one of the movies is an ad, and then I watch the movie, and I'm like, okay, you know what? Yeah, that's that's pretty true. I I, I don't know why they felt the need to... Well, I, it's because of profit, of course. I guess what I'm saying is, I don't know how you can be so shameless about it. You know, how do you... How do you how do you do that and, and like, you know, not wake up bathed in sweat thinking, I can't believe I actually turned the movie into such an ad. Just, yeah. And, yeah, we, f we find out that apparently, I forgot his name again, um, Pedro, apparently. Pedro is is gay and that's why he now sees an appeal to to baseball which you know that's a 
it's a it's an old joke it's a it's a trope you know this thing of no no, no like you know one character is like passionately explaining and another character's like you know i guess i'm starting to see and and then we get like a pov shot of them like ogling one of the players or dancers or whatever the the particular thing is you know I like that it's being done for a a gay character a lot of the time you know for yeah a bunch of and and without it being like a punchline or something you know it's not a punchline that he's gay the you know the punchline is oh he's not actually interested in the sport he just thinks you know oh hot stuff you know and that's yeah it, I'm, I'm really glad that we don't get so many it, or I don't know maybe it's in movies I don't watch but I don't see so many anymore of like isn't it funny and weird how this person is gay or trans or something you know just because boy do I hate those so yeah it, you know it's being the the fact that he's gay is being treated as just you know that's fine there's nothing wrong with that you know you could like if the scene had been instead of a guy looking at at baseball if it was a guy looking at like ballet and think oh those dancers are really hot you know the that would have been the 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 scene would have played played out the same way we're not laughing at a guy being attracted to other guys we're laughing that he's like you know oh Pretty cute. And actually, yeah, everyone says afterwards that they that they already knew and they fully accept that he's gay. Was Mary like not thinking that she could get him interested in the sport, but being like matchmaker almost kind of thing? Like she's like you know, Pedro, it's okay if you are attracted to other men kind of thing is is baseball a thing where you look at the players and think uh, I don't know I get oh it's cuz like Philadelphia has a baseball team or something right that's that's why it's baseball specific like I feel like I get like football you know I can I can understand if if you know if you're into dudes and you watch football to watch your know, sweaty, muscly men, but baseball, but I think that's probably because of the the thing with yeah. And let's see, yeah, I I like that, you know, Freddie is like oh, you know, amazing music, and and you know Billy goes up and and listens and oh wow that amazing band. I think we should go get tickets right now. And, you know, they're, like, using code to d discuss whether or not they're going to bring everyone or it's just going to be the two of them. You know, and, and, yeah, like, in the first movie, like, Freddy, you know, sh he got along with the other foster kids fine, but he was more, like, he wanted to be friends with, with Billy. You know, so this thing of... Um, what's the word? Um, you know, yeah, he he wants it to be the he wants it to continue being the two of them because in the first one, you know, yeah, it was their thing. So, yeah, and I I I don't know. I just love that it's a beautiful day. You know, here in Philadelphia, that's like code for let's go fight crime and this thing of like you know they all so they're all like oh okay i guess that's what we're doing now you know that none of them are like unhappy about it they're just surprised you know and yeah all of the foster kids prepare to to leave the house all at once so of course the foster parents are like Okay, what what did we miss? Where where is everyone going all at once? 
And Darla just adorably, you know, she's like, we're going to go fight crime. And like, at that point, like the, you know, Rosa and Victor, you know, they're like, okay, fine. Don't tell us. You don't you don't have to make up such a ridiculous ha ha go we're going to go fight crime just just be back before dinner okay that's you know you don't have to tell us fine but the, the yeah that was <laughs> let's see and yeah we see the the bridge collapsing and yeah, I I really really it's it's a very fun scene of you know the 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 yeah so so parts of the bridge are collapsing and she's like starting to slide down you know and there was like a second where I was like why doesn't she just get out of the car like at, at you know at what point are you gonna be like you know what insurance will probably cover the car but if I fall with it I'm not going to that that's gonna be it for me you know so but very very quickly after it starts singing it gets like very steep so like if she tried to step out of the car she would slide down as well you know so I appreciate that they took care of that you know and yeah you know she's sitting there I need a hero and just yeah, sometimes you gotta do the, the really obvious stuff, because, like, come on. It's a banger. It's, you know, of course people still listen to it. You know, it. The, this is one of those movies made by people who grew up in the 80s, so they still really love the, the music from, from back then and, and other, you know, movies and such. I, I really... Yeah, I, I could totally see people still... You know, sitting in their car on their long drive to work, you know, getting hyped up with with something like that, so that it doesn't feel quite so soul crushing. And the the uh, what's it called? Yeah, yeah. The some of the some of the like beams are starting to you know, so they fly up and and grab the the um wire thing, you know, and yeah, I, I felt like they did a good job getting, getting some, getting cool stuff out of this idea, you know, on paper, like, it's, it's already an, an interesting, you know, the bridges collapse, you know, the, the, I forget what those are called, but like, it's the, the, the Ra not not raised bridge, high wire bridge. I yeah, something like that. You know that that's starting to to crumble and and they're flying because like like I said in the review, okay, you know what? No, the cops or you know rescue no you know you need a superhero to deal with this or people are going to die in in this situation. And we, you know, we, we spend some time at the lair, and they made it fun, you know, you'd, you'd want to go there, like, the, the, um, um, what's it called, you know, they have, like, they put lights on the statues of the seven deadly sins, and, like, wrote stuff, and just, yeah, really... I, I love that the the place that has all the doors, like, I, uh, what, let's see, what was his name again? It was the, um, yeah, I think it was Eugene. You know, he's going into all these different doors, and he, he comes back out and is like, okay, A, okay, nothing bad inside that door, or coming out and being like, okay, we gotta put a warning on that door, and then he does. You know, it's rated M for mature, rated E for everyone, and like, it's, 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 yeah, that was that's such a such a great yeah. 
And yeah, once it's just Billy and Mary, you know, Billy is explaining the the um, or it, yeah, they're they're talking about the the issues that. Oh right, ah, uh, yeah, I just realized. I actually, yeah, the part where it cuts directly from the the daughters of Atlas talking about you know the champion must be a genius to to Billy saying he's an idiot that was the the therapy scene not the not the gaming scene uh, but but yeah and yeah you know when when we see Mary and Billy talking about issues I'm really, really glad that the Mary actor is the one in the, the suit as well. It would just feel so awkward. You know, in, in the first one, there's not a lot. You know, superhero Mary does not have a lot of screen time. So instead it is, you know, yeah, we're seeing the, the um, a, yeah, college age Mary you know, talking with others about issues and such. Now... Yeah, so the we see that the wizard has been uh, imprisoned by the daughters and they force him to fix the staff. And... Yeah. Um, Anne is very sweet with with Freddy, and let's be honest, like, if you are at all, you know, at all romantically, or honestly, even platonically, interested in Rachel Zegler, and she smiles at you, and laughs at one of your jokes, that, yeah, you know, no, it's no wonder that Freddy is smitten and Diedrich Bader shows up. I gotta say, I, yeah, I've. It's been a while since I saw him in in anything. I, you know, I'm not gonna claim that all of the Drew Carey show. Still not sure how that, how that was what they thought. The, that was what they thought was the best title for it. I'm not gonna claim that the entire show is like solid. I, I, I'm still not sure if I did watch like the whole thing. I know I watched like the first couple of seasons at least. There's nine seasons? Yeah, I don't think I watched all of them then. Or at least, yeah, it ran from 95 to 2004. But Deezer Bader as Oswald Lee Harvey, you know, big fan and obviously like Ryan Styles, like I've I've been a huge fan of him ever since seeing him on on the show, and it's some of his best work. Uh, you know that Two and a Half Men and Whose Line. Now and yeah, the uh, the wizard had a nail under his nail. That looked painful, and yeah, so Billy is with, you know, is having this dream about Wonder Woman, we don't see her face, and then suddenly it's the wizard's face there, which I... That's kind of transphobic. Like, we're supposed to be grossed out by the juxtaposition of a feminine body and a masculine head, and it's just... Really? You're st you're still doing this. Like, we have a huge problem with hatred towards trans people who literally just want to be allowed to live the way that feels you know, good and, and right for them. Like, I will... I've spent over 30 years trying to understand, and I probably never will understand, why some people 
would rather people bully someone who's doing nothing wrong than just let people who are doing something that isn't wrong, but it's a little different from what they're used to just you know have yeah just just live like you would think that th like the trans people were demanding like if you if you're face to face with a transphobe try to see if they have a stronger reaction to the idea that trans people are gonna like force everyone to transition versus just trans people want you know if if yeah the 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 idea the ideology the is just that if you're trans you should be allowed to transition and live openly as a trans person you know the, it doesn't affect your life in the slightest it really doesn't like Now, let's see, you know, you know, like, for sure, like, if trans people were going around saying everyone has to transition, no one is allowed to be cis, but that's not what, you know, that's what the, 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 um, let's be honest, Nazis, that's what the, the growing number of Nazis, they want everyone to be the same. But trans people just want to be allowed to live as trans people. They don't want to be forced to be cis because it doesn't feel right to them. It's just like if if cis people who are transphobic were not allowed to live as cis people, they would freak out. They would be way more bothered by it than trans people are. Now, let's see. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm such a mark for this kind of thing. I liked when the wizard was like, whatever you do, you can't let the daughters of Atlas, and then he's not allowed, you know, he's not able to finish the, the thought, so that's, yeah. I, I yeah. And I like Anne and Freddy bonding over their overprotective siblings. And yeah, they do point out that the wizard died in the first film. <laughs> and Mary was out partying the night before, and they're all like, okay, um, we can't tell Darla about alcohol. That's not, she's not ready for that. So they say, oh, you know, she went to the eye doctor. And like, oh, yeah, I, I went out, I met people. You met people at the eye doctor? It's just, wow. So pure. And... <laughs> and Pedro is having Steve writing the, the book report. I, I really, really liked Steve. That was... Just, uh, did he just shrug? Yeah, I, I guess. And... Yeah. You know, Freddy and Anne are on, you know, on the, um... Ah, what's it called? You know, on, yeah, on top of a building. And... The, you know, it's that thing where, you know, Freddy really wants to impress the, the, you know, you have the, yeah, you have the character who really wants to, yeah, it's, it's usually a male character who really wants to impress a girl, and, you know, he's like, well, I'm not very impressive myself, but, you know, I can turn into this other, this comic book alter, e alter ego kind of, you know, like off the top of my head, the mask does something similar, and the yeah, and didn't the I think some of the Superman, the original Richard Donner, yeah, um, 
Superman, I think, also does something. I forget. Uh, not, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure if it's one of the Richard Donner ones, but it's one of the... I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. Uh, I will have it momentarily. Superman was played by... Christopher Reeve. One of the... At least one of the Christopher Reeve Superman movies. You had this thing of... You know... The... the um, ah, what's it called? Yeah, you know, trying to impress, try, yeah, being like, oh, I, I know that person, and, you know, rushing off, and then in comes the, the alter ego kind of thing, but it's also, you know, Anne does know this whole thing, and she, you know, she wasn't expecting to, to fall for, for Freddy, but she was you know, using this, this thing, you know, the, that's a lie, no, that's your superpower. <laughs> now, let's see, and, you know, Lucy Lou whispers something to Diedrich Bader, and, you know, he goes and, and jumps off a, a building, so, if I had to guess, she probably whispers something like, You'll never be on whose line. And she's like, Oh, I forgot how frail they are. Pop like a grape. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, the villain. Like, there's no remorse. There's no like, Oh, I didn't mean to do that. No, it's just like, huh. Pop like a grape. And they take Freddy's power, and the force field is set up, which is also a clever. Let's see. And the um, yeah, I liked Fred, Freddy, and and the wizard in in the cell. This this thing of. <laughs> You know, after a while, it does become clear. No, like he's doing it on purpose. Like the the um, the wizard knows that his name is Freddy. He's just being a jerk, you know. And that's kind of funny. And and it is also like, holy crap, Freddy is being annoying, you know. And and there's also that thing of you know, okay. You know, the, the, they put me in this cell, and worst of all, they put me in the cell with you. You know, it's, it's yeah. And and Freddy's like, how are you, wizard? You don't know spells? You don't have any potions? You don't have ruins? You know, just all these things. And it's like, that's, that's legitimately funny, because it is, you know, in the first one, he... You know, he his like specialized knowledge was useful for figuring out what are Shazam's powers, and you know the the yeah there there were there were things that were accomplished, but here it's like you know some of the time he's he's not really accomplishing very much because it is this you know it's almost too specialized kind of so that was yeah. And let's see, that brings us to, yeah, I um I liked when when they're you know the daughters are asking for, for details and you know like okay, so who are the other champions? And he tries to claim that the Briars, the, the two bully brothers, are the, the you know, some of the champions, so that the the so that the daughters will will like do really awful things to them and just yeah that was that was funny the theater lost it when helen mirren read aloud steve's letter i'm so like it's such a funny because it is that they, you know if if 
like I've had to sit and and go through my notes and be like, oh wow, whoops, I really when I was when I was just thinking out loud to to jot down, you know, to to yeah, to take some notes with voice to text. I didn't think about how I was phrasing that, so now I gotta go and remove some of the words. Yeah, if you have like a, a pen doing it, you know, so you can't just erase, and and you're like having a discussion with other people, you know, and just, that was that was really really funny, and and she sells it like, you know, this like she played the queen, you know, she's a she's. She was, she, she is a, um, lady, I guess is what it's called, like, you know, the, the, I'm not 100% sure which of the, but one of the royals, like, gave her a, um, special, um, like, yeah, made, made her a, a lady the way they made others, lords, or, I, I forget what it's called, but yeah, that, that kind of thing, you know, she's, she's, She's very well respected, and she can she can pick and choose. She doesn't have to do this. So clearly, like she realized how how funny this would be, and she plays it exactly right because the way she reads it, she's like, I can't believe it. You know, she she never accidentally because the the character doesn't realize how funny this is, and it wouldn't be funny if she did realize it. You know the the. Some of the fun is in the juxtaposition, in, in this, like, you know, it's this workshop letter by a bunch of teenagers who are, you know, trying to be smart about it, but they didn't think about, you know, oh, we, you know, maybe we should, like, work it out, and then, like, you know, hypothetically, if I was a member of the Shazamly, what I would say is, okay, let's, before we say, before we tell Steve to write anything, Let's figure out together what we want to write, and we'll sit down with pencil and eraser, and we'll work out what we want it to be, and then once we have the wording, then we will read aloud that to Steve. He'll write it in, in you know, yeah, proper pen and, and send it off, you know, but it's, yeah. Let's see, and... Yeah, the the maze is also very you know very very cool, and and we get a brief glimpse of the, or no, not just a brief glimpse, but we get an introduction, a, a short introduction to the the dragon, which you know Anne explains, you know the the what was it? Its gaze will drain, you know will will bind you in fear, or so, something like that, so we understand what that is when we see it later. I really, really enjoyed Hespera's monologue at Billy, where, you know, when she's explaining why it's personal, and it was, it was pretty funny when, you know, she, he's talking about, you know, oh, I've seen all the uh, Fast and the Furious movies, and I've, I forget who it was, but one of the late night hosts pointed out Helen Mirren was in one of those, so it's a you know, but that is like you know, it's fine for the DCU to dip its toes in that because the MCU has referenced a lot of movies that like you know, like Tony Stark legit referenced The Big Lebowski, and it's like. Does he think that Dude Lebowski looks a lot like Obadiah Stane? Or is that like, you know, anyway. The, yeah, some great fighting between the Jazamily and the daughters. I thought they did a good job of like splitting them up. You know, obviously you can't have all of them fighting in the exact same spot all at the same time. That's just going to be a, a chaotic blur, a mess. So, you know, you got to split them up and yeah, you know, a couple of them go to fight the the you know, one of the the daughters, a couple of them go for the the other and such. 
and oh yeah, this this is when the oh hmm. yeah, and the the you know we see that Hespera escaped her cell, and I like that we see it. You know they wrote timeout zone or something like that. You know. Um, on on the cell door, like teenagers would. And yeah, it it is kind of nice when the wizard does intentionally pronounce Freddy's name right. I I like the bit where you know the wizard mispronounces it and and Freddy is like, she just said my full name, you know. How do you get it wrong? Yeah, I really appreciate that everybody, you know, everybody already knew that Pedro was, you know, that, that he's gay, and everybody just accepts it, because that is how it should be, you know. The, the you know, a lot of people can, can tell that kind of thing even before a person comes out, so, so that's, you know, that, you know, not, not everybody is going to, but some can. But the fact that, you know, when, like, when he, fi when he realizes that they know, he sees that they accept it. So, you know, basically the message of the, of, of that aspect of the movie is the people who, you know, good people should, you know, yeah, good people accept when someone is gay, the you know they don't make an issue out of it. Let's see, and yeah, love seeing the dragon in our world. I'm really, really glad that they didn't bring the dragon into, you know, like right away. I I I guess is it maybe the last, either the second half of the movie or the last third of the movie the dragon is in our world instead of just in the maze, you know, and yeah, because it really raises the stakes. It's, you know, the, the kind of things, the kinds of things that the, the dragon can do, you know, the fact that its fire can actually hurt, you know, the Jazamli. And they plant the seed at the baseball stadium, which I'm guessing... Philadelphia has a famous baseball stadium or and yeah we see some Greek mythological creatures including a manticore a minotaur a cyclops we got some harpies love it absolutely love seeing so much and you know I I like that Victor recogn you know he runs one over and he's like okay I can run over minotaurs all the live long day. What are we going to, you know, the, or yeah, there's only so many minotaurs I can run over with our car, you know. Just the the, you know, he's not like what is that? He's like, okay. I remember some Greek mythology. That's a minotaur. It's dead. There's a lot of others. What are we going to do about all those, you know? That's yeah, I I love when it's when you have characters in a movie that are just like, well, I, I read about that in a book once, so, yeah, now it's real, evidently, you know, instead of being like, what's that, and being completely useless to the heroes, he's just like, there's only so many Minotaurs I can run over with the same car. And, yeah, it is kind of sweet when Freddy and Anne kiss, and... And we get the thing about how she's apparently 6,000 years old, so that's, yeah. And I really liked when Billy, instead of saying Soph, um, we do have, uh, yeah, Rosa, not so, why did I write Sophia? Anyway, instead of calling her Rosa again, he called her mom, because, you know, that that is, like, it's not... I, you know, we, we really have to get away from this notion that biological parentage is more important. Like, 
the the um, found family can be as important and sometimes more important you know and I feel like these two movies do a really great job of communicating that you know the the um, I wouldn't say that Billy's real mother Billy's biological mother see I have to I have to get there too I'm not I'm not saying I'm 100% you know I I got to catch myself and correct myself too sometimes Billy's biological mother is not a bad person but you know she wasn't the right person to to raise Billy and you know when he once he finally realizes no it's it's found family you know and and he can he can connect with other foster kids you know this yeah these are these are we we see that he has much more meaningful relationships with the foster family than he does with his biological mother and then here we have this you know he's he's worried that he's gonna end up being kicked out of the foster home so he he's reluctant to call Rosa mom even though that is you know yeah she she adopted him she or uh, false ah crap I've I forget how the terms work, but but yeah, she is his foster mother. So so yeah, she is his mother. The you know it again. We're not talking about like oh they just pulled someone in ran at random from the street. No, she she read his file. She said I want to be a mother to this kid, and you know she has been. So the the yeah. I'm, I'm, I really appreciate these two movies trying to normalize because it is, it's so much healthier than, than holding out for, you know, I, I don't personally have experiences uh, with it, but I've, you know, yeah, I've seen a lot of cases where someone was much happier with a foster family, foster parents, foster siblings, than their biological family. And yeah, I I really appreciate the the detail, you know, when when yeah, Calypso, you know, she makes her speech, and Hespera points out, you sound like was it our uncle Hades, you know, which is also one one for the. For the for the uh, mythology buffs, there you know, like, ah, Hades, uh, is this, you know, if if you have no idea, you know, that's that might not mean anything to you. But let's be honest, most of the people who are passionate about this movie know at least a thing or two about you know Greek myth, and Hades is a very popular, you know, he's, there's a lot of pop culture, Hades versions, there's a lot of fascination with, uh, so, yeah, and, and, you know, Hesperus keeping it real is absolutely true, Calypso is sounding like Hades. I th it, yeah, I think it was specifically the, the kind of, was it absolutism or something like that, you know, I'm, I'm not saying you know it was it was a one to one like Hades and Anne becomes human and Steve helps in the van that was yeah and there's a there's a you know the um what's it called um The um, ah, crap. this is really not, okay. I'm almost certain that. Oh, okay. There was this. Hmm. 
I guess. Okay. Um, I did a Google search for, for Cameo, and it found absolutely nothing about the one I was thinking about. It was only about the, the Wonder Woman and... Oh, right, yeah, it m might be... Huh. Nah, maybe not. Um, okay, so the um, I'm gonna I'm gonna really quickly see if it's on the on the cast. Yeah, there's a let's see F Douglas Hall the second is on the credits as. Jassam fan. I think he is the one who's actually standing in like of uh, uh you know he's he's wearing like the colors and he says and he you know he offers the suggestion of the name Captain Marvel. So that's a, a neat little you know, I guess by now they weren't afraid to to you know they I'm almost certain they never say the words Captain Marvel in the first movie. And it is that thing of, you know, like for a while, he was called Captain Marvel. And, then, you know, it's a it's a thing. It's on Wikipedia. Let's see. And, yeah. Unicorns. And Skittles tame unicorns and you know when they're when they're riding on them um yeah D darla goes taste the rainbow mother and then it's censored by uh, i think it was one of the unicorns making a, i i don't what do, what do horses uh nay i guess but the yeah that was that was pretty surreal I I'll acknowledge that it, it you know if it wasn't product placement it would be kind of cute that she's like here's some skittles it's the closest thing we have to ambrosia I just feel like you know if they had maybe had like I mean skittles aren't even that like amazing like at least make it some kind you know what I would kind of have respected if it was, let's see, Philadelphia ch 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 cheesesteak, maybe? Yeah, if she had been like, you're never going to get anything better than a Philly cheesesteak, you know, that, that kind of thing. So it was like at least some regional pride or something, but just Skittles because they paid us money. It just, yeah, I, I really felt like that was, yeah. But I do really appreciate the detail that, no, 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 um, unicorns will mess you up. They do not like humans. They are nothing like ponies, you know, which I, I'm not 100%, I guess I could do a really quick, let's see, the, uh, here we go. Um... Okay, there's a lot of, uh, I guess I'll, um, okay, uh, some of the uh, Google says that they, okay, they're, they're not pretty, but they, they are peaceful. Um, gentle creatures that love nature and other animals. Okay, so it's a it's a different yeah. So the joke in the movie is that you know we've been told that unicorns are you know positive, but no no no, like the the wizard knows better. Unicorns are bad news, you know. So so that's yeah. I approve. It was funny. And and seeing unicorns that are distinctly not, like, cute and cuddly, but, like, you know, they, they legitimately did look, like, ornery, like, just, yeah, like, like, wild animals or something. 
when we're, you know, yeah, I already mentioned I watched Legend, you know, that has some very, like, basically, like, angelic unicorn, so, so, yeah. And Billy Diffibes Hespera, and, you know, you might say, well, has, hasn't her heart been stopped for too many minutes that you could just zap her back, and, I, and it did kind of, like, you know, he zaps her back, and he's like, come, come on, come up, you know, and she's like, just let me go to the afterlife in peace, you know, just, because, like, you know, she knows how this is supposed to go. You know, but, but yeah. Okay, her heart has been stopped for, like, a while now. You know, for, for more than just, like... I, I, I don't know exactly how long, but, but I... Um, or I guess it's, it's a brain damage that people are worried about. If your heart stops and too long passes before you start the heart back. I, I forget. But, you know, well, wasn't she dead for longer? However, if she is thousands of years old, you know, clearly her heart works differently than a human heart. So, sure, she can, you know, be brought back. And, yeah, you know, Ladon, is that how, or was it Laden? Something like that, you know, the, the dragon is like trying to to kill Anne and I really got a, a blood dragon vibe off it and yeah the point is made you can be a hero without powers and made you look twice this time I didn't even need a burning violin and the force field gets significantly smaller because it's cold and I don't know what that means. Um, so, Hespera knows what a bomb is, but she thinks Mountain Dew is a weapon? I don't know, I just felt like, I mean, did they have bombs? An ancient green. I, I feel like that, I don't know. And, you know... Billy self-sacrifices and, you know, they do manage to, to bring him back, but, you know, he was a god, let's, he should be laid to rest as one, and, you know, they're like, well, there are no more gods, there's one, and, you know, Gal Gadot, Wonder Woman, walks in, and apparently, like, that was spoiled for some people, like, holy crap. Like, it literally happens right before the movie ends. It's not like she's a big part of an action scene or something. Like, that, yeah, I get why people were upset that that was spoiled for them. I, I didn't know until the the scene. You know, obviously, when, when we see her, but we don't see her face, you know, I couldn't help but wonder, is she gonna show up at some point for real? But I wasn't, like, sitting there, okay, any minute now, you know, I, yeah, I think, I, actually, I kind of figured, well, I guess they're not going to show us, or Gal Gadot is not going to be playing Wonder Woman in this movie, or they would have had her in the dream he had. And that was also, I, I do like, because, you know, maybe you don't remember, or maybe you didn't really pay attention, but in the end credits to the first movie, Shazam does imagine stealing the Batmobile and taking Wonder Woman to prom. And that is, of course, exactly what a straight teenage boy would do if he had those kinds of powers. And, you know, he's he has this very simple idea. He thinks, if I have superpowers, Wonder Woman will go out with me. And I appreciate that in the, you know, and, and it was presented as just, you know, this juvenile fantasy and in this movie, we straight up, you know, she's not at all interested in him. You know, she's a stick to saving the world. And, yeah, she restores the staff, and he comes back. 
Anne becomes a god again, and yeah, Billy is back, and I like the zombie, zombie, yeah, just, and, and, you know, he's like, come on, guys, I, you bury me even though I, you know, I've only been dead for so, you know, and with one row, and she's like, uh, you got a little, oh, oh, that's a spider, that's disgusting. You know, and yeah, like he has this very simplistic view of male to female relationships. So he thinks, you know, now that he has superpowers and she has superpowers, maybe they could go out, you know. And he, you know, he makes sure to say, just because Zeus was your father and I have some of his powers doesn't mean we're related. So it wouldn't be weird, you know, and. Yeah, you know, she's, she just walks off and says, stick to saving the world, kid. And, you know, yeah, I, I really appreciate that it didn't ruin her characterization by making... There's no way. There's no way. The Wonder Woman that was in the first movie, and honestly, even the one in the second, would not be interested in... The, you know, what, 18 year, yeah, ba almost 18 year old. Just because, oh, he has superpowers. <clears throat> the wizard says, it's time to see your world, so, taking a page out of the book of genie i guess and you know freddy is told no no jesam no, is the name of you know and he still wants a different name and so we get the mid credits where the peacemaker people offer billy a place in the justice society not the justice league and they leave it vague as to whether he says yes you know and yeah, they, they easily could. Uh, you know, the, the, um, the... You could easily have him be on the, the Justice Society. I guess if he had to be a member of the Justice League, he would have to first meet some of the other members. But, but yeah, there is... <clears throat> And we get the post credit scene of Mr. Mind calling for patience and saying, you know, he has a plan, they will be victorious. Let's see. And we get, you know, tell me everything. So, so yeah, hopefully, I guess if, if Mr. Mind becomes a big... I guess he could probably threaten the entire either Justice Society or Justice League. <clears throat> or maybe they do that thing where they have several... What's it called? T um, several villains get together. Anyway, <clears throat> that is almost it. So I did see... Um... Yeah, I saw one reviewer say Hollywood making a child's character gay is super weird and uncomfortable. Making a super supporting role or character more interesting can be done without sexualizing them. Why is it sexual just because he's gay? It's quite clear that the the you know character the characters of Freddy and Billy are straight. They're not of age yet. Why is that not sexual? Why is it sexual when it's clear that they're not straight? Like, there's no way. Like, it's completely clear that Billy and Freddy have more than platonic feelings for the woman that they're, you know, interested in. But this reviewer didn't think that that was sexualizing them. So it's just, it's, it's again this thing of, hmm, this, this 
propaganda about the LGBTQ that that yeah that LGBTQ people you know are going you know, are grooming children it yeah there's there's absolute there's the fact that Pedro is gay is not you know the the he spends there's less of the movie is devoted to him looking at men than is devoted to Freddy you know trying to to get with Anne or Billy trying to to talk Wonder Woman into going on a date with him you know so yeah it's it's purely the the this notion that if it's not straight it must be sexual where if as long you know if it's straight no no, no that's okay that's you know that's somehow not sexual even though i mean if anything an argument could be made that it is more specifically sexual if it's straight because it's specifically like about procreation and natural procreation involves sex you know the the yeah so that's that's it for this video so let me know in the comments what is your favorite DCU movie or yeah DCEU movie what are your hopes for the next Jazam? And let's see. Were there any were there any creatures from Greek myth that you wished had been in this movie? And maybe what's your favorite of the ones that we did get? I really, really loved seeing Minotaur. That's that is that is my jam. So yeah. The the yeah. If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell like it's working for the Daughters of Atlas. There should be a link to my main channel page, one or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, and one talking about my spoilerful thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus live-action Star Wars show, which these days is The Mandalorian, and recently the Ruin Thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you're more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog, so we'll catch my next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.